Lord is needed and saves those who are crushed. Let us admit our sins before God, first in unison and then in a time. Let us pray together. Merciful God, in your presence our sinfulness, our shortcomings, our offenses against you. You know how often we have sinned in, in our days, in wasting your gifts, getting your love. Have mercy on us, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your ways and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the good news. If we have died Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God, in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian. I want you to reach for the friendship pads located on the center. Uh, please take the pad, sign it, passing the pew, observing the names of those in worship with you. Sunday. If you're a guest or visitor, there's a view with a red ribbon on it. It would be helpful to put that on so that worship is sitting behind you and in front of you who did have the bed of friendship pad may extend to you a warm welcome. Monday morning. For those of you who are with us by way of television, we are First Presbyterian Church of North Carolina. We're located at the state capital, and we are privileged that you are us this morning in worship. For your prayers, for your financial contributions, help gird this special outreach ministry. For guests and visitors, we continue our orientation information classes. These classes are helpful for individuals. Interested in finding out about the Presbyterian Church through this commission? The classes are held during the church school Sunday school from 9.45 to approximately 10.50. Held in the Balkan Paula, a room that uh, we encourage folks to go to after the close of the worship service. Fellowship, a place easy to find right off of Salisbury Street when one comes into the sanctuary. If you're here and you're looking for a church home, uh, there's a place to check on your pad, your interest in receiving information, or perhaps a visit. And if you desire to speak with an individual, an officer, there is one present each Sunday in the session room to my right who is ready to talk with you about how one becomes a member by translator, by reaffirmation of faith, by profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And there's also the procedure of affiliate membership, quite helpful for individuals who want to have a church home but will be in the area for a short period of time, particularly uh, individuals in business or students at one of the area colleges here in Angle. So we welcome all of you to worship and gather this Sunday morning. We continue as we sing together the hymn, Fight the Guide, Hymn 307.
You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson comes to us this morning from the book of Psalms, Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs horse with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise simple. The, Lord pre the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord is true and righteous altogether. More to be desired they than gold, ever much fine gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from faults. Keep back dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue now our reading of scripture as we turn to the New Testament and Paul's letter to the Philippian Christians. We are reading verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 4, latter part of verse 4, down to verse 15. And here the Apostle Paul sharing with us a witness in regard to his own Christian faith and experience and the aspiration that he had for spiritual growth. This is the word of God to us, therefore let us tend to that word. If when anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born to Hebrew as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gain I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of the resurrection and the sharing of his springs by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from death. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God. Let us now bow our head in a brief moment of prayer. <clears throat> o Lord God, rightly interpret us your word of truth, that we may be obedient doers of that word and not hearers only. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
There are many things which distinguish Christianity from the other world religions. And one of the most significant of those things is this. We Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead after he had been crucified and that he lived today to be known by those who trust in him. The same Jesus who was born almost 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, who lived, died, who rose again, still lives today. And consequently, to know him personally, intimately, and experientially, the first and foundational goal of any Christian person's existence. Now, this was also the inspiration of the great Apostle Paul, as we read about it in our text today, particularly in verses 10 and 11. I want to know Christ, he says, in the power of his resurrection, in the sharing of his sufferings, by coming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul wanted to know Jesus Christ. And the fervency of that desire is abundantly clear in his words, knowing Christ fully and completely was the overriding goal of his life. It was, in fact, what kept him going. The fact of persecution and pain, Paul's desire to know Christ was found, out of which flowed all great deeds and accomplishments of his powerful ministry. And likewise, it should be our aspiration as Christians, too, to come to Jesus Christ in a very similar kind of way, to come to know him in a direct, immediate, and personal manner. But some of you may ask, well, what does it mean in this of history for us to know Jesus Christ? Well, there's all the difference in the world between knowing a person and knowing about that person. We all know about numerous people, but never honestly say that we know that person at all. For instance, millions of people may feel that they know President Clinton, even though they've never been in his physical presence. They've seen him on television, they've read about him in the newspapers and magazines. They may even have a broad knowledge of his opinions, his politics, and something about his character. But while they have plenty of knowledge about President Clinton, they could never truthfully say that they know him. For you see, there's a vast difference between the knowledge of the person on the street and the knowledge of those who know the president personally, who live with him in the circle of his family, his friends, and his close working associates. It was this same kind of immediate and personal knowledge of Jesus Christ that Paul wanted of all else. He did not want Christ merely from a human point of view. He was not content with knowing only the facts about Jesus. It's quite possible that he knew all of that, all of the facts about Jesus before he ever became a Christian. What Paul desired most was not to know Christ as a personage from the pages of the history book or as a symbol that comes from the tomes of theology, but to know him as a living Lord as a living Christ, a friend and Savior in his own soul. And it's still this kind of knowledge of Jesus Christ which makes all the difference in the world for us today. The knowledge of Christ comes through personal experience and personal relationship with him. Now, of course, this is in no way to minimize the importance of the theological or the historical because through the study of the witness about Jesus in the Bible that began that personal and experiential knowledge, which is the thing most needful. In an amazing way, when we read the gospel story, we become aware that we're not just dealing with someone who lived and died almost 2,000 years ago, but we're actually reading about, and in some mystical way by the Holy Spirit, we're dealing with a living person actually in touch with our person and our spirit in this present moment. It's still true that historic knowledge is one thing and spiritual knowledge is quite another. It's probably true to say that there are lots of people who know about Jesus, who know the, the facts, the, the rudimentary information about his life and death and what he taught and what he did, but they still do not know him in any sort of personal way. But the fact remains that we today cannot really experience forgiveness
forgiveness of our sins today cannot be redeemed and stored to our relationship to God if we have only a relationship with a dim and distant figure from the past, but only by one who the living presence and power within us. This brings us to the second aspect of what it means to know Jesus Christ. To know him means to experience the enlivening power, the enlivening force of his resurrection. The Apostle Paul tells us in this Bible text that his desire to Christ did not stop merely with a personal acquaintance. He also wanted to experience something of the dynamic of his resurrection. I want to know Christ, said Paul. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Now, Paul was not speaking here of some abstract knowledge of a theological concept called resurrection. And he was speaking about an abstract knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ himself. As one who had been trained as a Pharisee, he knew all about the doctrine of resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the theology, theology of resurrection. So Paul believed that part of the creed before he ever became a Christian. And Paul also knew the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave on the third day. He had talked to persons who were first-hand witnesses to the risen Lord. He knew all of the evidence that Christ was truly risen from the grave. And he even proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus Christ in his preaching wherever he went. But none of this is what Paul is talking about in the verses. Rather, the Apostle Paul is saying here that in addition to knowing about the resurrection, he wants to experience the dynamic of his power. Well, Paul realized that it would be impossible for him to please God and to live a life which honored Jesus Christ if it depended upon his own natural resources, his powers and abilities. Paul had previously written to the Christian believers in the city of Corinth that sinful human persons cannot possibly understand spiritual truth. For as Paul wrote, they are foolish to them and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And furthermore, Paul had experienced the frustration of his own inability to live a life as God intended to behave as he knew that God wanted him to do. And so again, wrote his letter to the Christians at home. He had to confess, I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. Now I'm certain that all of us here today have tried seriously to serve God and who have really attempted to live a life that is honoring to Him experience that same kind of frustration of defeat. We may have struggled with all of our might and some bad habit which is hogtied or we sought to break free for some sin which has shackled us, but our best efforts at that proved to be in vain. Like the old cartoon character Pogo, we have confessed, we have met the enemy, he is us. And like all, we too may cry out in the frustration of our feet. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this, this deadly failure? Every one of us has really tried to do the right thing has no powerful grip of sin. But Paul knew that there was a power greater than the vice grip of sin. He knew that he did not have to continually be the victim of his own failure and weaknesses. The strongest power in the world was God's power, and if it had been manifested to our sin-defeated world by that divine power which had raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So when Paul cried out the letter to the Romans, who will rescue me from this body of death, he answered his own question by saying, thanks be to God, it is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, Paul testifies here 
the overriding aspiration of his life is to know Jesus and to experience the dynamic power of his resurrection, bringing him victory in every aspect of his living. But what does resurrection power of Jesus Christ mean for us here and now? Too often I think we make a little blunder of thinking of the resurrection only in the past and future tenses. I find it exhilarating on Easter Sunday morning to look back over the centuries and to sing with joy, Christ the Lord is risen today. And then later, perhaps at a funeral for a loved one or a dear friend, we look forward to the future, to that great resurrection hope as it's proclaimed in the New Testament, the resurrection of the dead to eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. But what power does the risen Christ have for us at this present moment? Well, when Jesus spoke about resurrection and life, he spoke of it not in future tense, but in the present tense. Or as one Bible scholar so aptly put it, in the mystic tense. For as he says, we can live it here and now. And likewise, when Paul talks about resurrection power, he indicates that it comes not just in future anticipation, but in present experience. Not just with Christ risen in one's creed, but with Christ risen in reality in one's life. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ is a great and present reality. Many Christians have come to discover that fact firsthand. And therefore they can sing the words of that old familiar hymn with joyous enthusiasm. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He gets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood of it for me. And then finally. We can learn from Paul that knowing Jesus Christ in this kind of way is a progressive experience. Now, if you read all the way down through this text that we read in our scripture, you will note that Paul seems to speak in that text of knowing Christ in a personal way and creating the power of his resurrection as though it might still be for him something of a completely future experience. But you say, had not Paul at the very moment that he wrote this letter already known Christ in a direct and experimental way? And had he not also at this point experienced something of the victory of our resurrection power in daily living and in the mission he carried out in the world? Of course Paul had experienced that. He had known Christ in that way for years. That is happened to him beginning on the day when he met Christ on the Damascus road when he was confronted by the living Lord and his knowledge of the facts about Jesus were changed to spiritual and personal knowledge and he established that abiding relationship with Jesus Christ himself but the experience you see was by no means confined to that great and critical occasion in Paul's life Rather, it was the beginning of a process. It became for Paul a continuous and growing experience. And the very arrangement of the phrases as he writes in this text sets forth the progressive order of that kind of spiritual growth. First, Paul says, we're fronted by Christ. We come to know him in that personal experiential way. Next, we experience something of his resurrection power as we gain victory over some of our besetting sins and failures. And then as we come to know Jesus better and better, day in and day out through time, we begin to become partners in suffering as we live more and more as he did. Until at length, says Paul, we are willing to share in his death, which means, as Paul wrote also to the Christians in the city of Colossae, that our selfish egos, our sinful wills, are put to death with Christ, are crucified with Christ. So as Paul says, it is no longer we who live, but it is Christ who is in control. He is alive in us. Do you see what that might imply to you in a very practical sense? It would mean that you walk the streets as you enter to your home, as you go to the stores, as you move into your office or your club or your place of business, 
as you mingle with your friends, other human persons, that you would be so enlivened and connected by Jesus Christ that you would be like one who is fully and fully alive in God in the midst of a world that seems very dead because of sin. Is it desire to, to live the kind of life so to live in Christ as to be an unmistakable evidence of spiritual life, resurrection life, in the midst of a world that seems so spiritually dead? And you ask, can such a change occur in me? Is it possible for, and for you to begin to experience that kind of dynamic spiritual dimension in our relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, of course it's possible. Because God, who is the one who does changing? If he could change Saul, persecutor, into Paul, the great missionary apostle, and send the braggart into Peter, the man, the rock of faith, John, the sunder, and John, the evangelist of love, surely he has the ability to change each one of us into the kind of person in whom Christ holy and loving character might be seen in this world. This, see, is the will of God for each one of us, his people. Will you be open to that? Will you ask him to do that kind of transforming work in your life? Amen. And now, having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us affirm our faith together using the traditional Apostles' Creed found on page 14. All who are able, please stand as we say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He is in heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come and judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As God has given, oh, please be seated. As God has given us many things, let us now give back to God His tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for these gifts that have been given. We ask that your blessing be upon them and that we may use them to further the service of your church and know the will that you wish to be done. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, number one. Oh. Friends, this is the joyful feast to people of God. Men and women will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at table. All who are here this day are reminded that this is the Lord's table. The Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. And thus we invite all to come to the table. Those of you who are members of any branch of the Christian church who have been baptized, invited to the sacrament of Holy Communion which use us, because Christ is indeed our crucified and risen Lord. Hear the words of the instant of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, as delivered by the Apostle Paul. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. As the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and wine, I tell you these elements to be set apart from all common use, the holy use and mystery. Our Lord gave thanks and blessed. Let us draw nigh unto God and present unto him our prayers and thanksgivings. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Holy God, we thank you for commanding light out of darkness. You formed the universe in your wisdom and created all things by your power. You set us in families on the earth to live with you in faith. We praise you for good gifts of bread and wine 
for the table you spread in the world as a sign of your love for all people in Christ. Great and wonderful are your works, Lord God Almighty. Your ways are just and true. With people of faith from all times and places, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, for you alone are holy. Holy Father and loving parent of us all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who lived with us sharing joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and was murdered by people he loved. We praise you that he is not dead, but is risen to the world, and that he is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us, so that when you bring in your promised kingdom, we will celebrate victory with him. Great God, give your Holy Spirit in the breaking of bread, so that we may be drawn together and joined to Christ the Lord, receive new life, and remain his glad and faithful people, and we feast with him in glory. O oh God, who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you. And with the church through all ages, we thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray now the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day our daily bread, and give us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and, and the power, power and, and the glory, glory forever. Amen. Amen. On the night on which our Lord was prayed, he was having supper with his disciples, celebrating the feast of Passover. And he took the bread and he broke it. And after giving the blessing of thanksgiving, he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of you.
He said, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Let us eat together. After supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me.
Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. Let us now in union with each other in Jesus Christ partake of the cup together. Let us give thanks for God is good and God's love is forever. O oh God, our help, we thank you for the supper shared in the spirit of your Son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you, even as in Christ you have served us. Amen. Let us sing now our closing hymn, the first and the fourth stanzas of number 376, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. As you go forth from this place today, make it your aspiration to know Jesus Christ and to make him known in your world. Seek to experience the power of his resurrection in your daily living and be willing to share in the fellowship of his sufferings that we might give glory to God and that we may be witnesses to his love in our world. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and forever. Amen.